I hope he was. But uh, Johnny Cash sang that song, Donkey on Shaggy and Brown. You believe that? So you can get the Johnny Cash version uh, this evening. All right. Let's get our Bibles open now. Here we go. Zechariah, the next to the last book in the Old Testament. The next to the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah. We'll look here this evening at this uh, uh, book of prophecy here tonight. And here's what, here's what I'm going to do. It's like when you go across the mountains and you just hit the, tip, the peaks of the mountains, going skipping. That's what we're going to like a water, a rock skipping on water. There is no way in the world that we can talk about everything in this great prophetic book. But here's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to try to help you, try to instruct you, and then I'm going to try to provoke you to want to study. Because I'm, I'm going to get into some stuff here tonight, maybe some of y'all have never heard of before in your life, and uh, don't don't reject it just because you've never heard it. Just because you never heard something don't mean it's wrong. Don't act like a hillbilly. Uh, uh, just uh, get be open to the truth of the Word of God, and then study to show thyself proved in God. Workmen need not be ashamed. Zechariah. His name means Jehovah remembers. And he was the, ne the next to the last of these 12 uh, prophets here ending the time of prophecy. However, him and Haggai and Malachi were the three that preached to Israel after the, what we call the Babylonian captivity. Now Micah that I preached about last Sunday night, he was one of them prophets before they went into captivity. The first temple was destroyed. And then they stayed in the captivity, I forget, 70 years or whatever how long it was. And they came back, and then these guys started preaching. Israel still didn't get right with God. They still worshiped idols. They still did wrong. And these prophets, God raised up to smack them and rebuke them and tell about what happened. But, but you'll notice all the way through there, even though Israel was messed up and backslid and, and everything else, did you know all the way through there, the Lord always said, but I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to bless you. That's that everlasting covenant yes. that he made with Abraham. Non-negotiable, non-conditional covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, you'll hear on the news all the time now that the reason Hamas and Palestine has a right to fight back or fight Israel is because that Israel is occupying their land. That's what the nuts at college that go to college and ain't got enough sense, honestly, uh, to decorate a Christmas tree. Uh, they, but they, they, they go to college. They think uh, Israel came in there and took those poor people's land. They have no idea the history uh, of that, that Israel owned that land before there ever was a Palestinian. Listen, Israel is not occupying that land. They own it. They own it. It's given to them by God. It's not mine. I didn't write the Bible. I'm, I'm just the, the man that preaches it. So the book of Zechariah has 14 chapters, 211 verses, 6,443 inspired words in your King James Bible. It has around 150 prophecies in it, and most of them have not even yet been fulfilled. They are still future. You'll hear a lot, see a lot in this book about the millennium, the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, as Israel during the tribulation, and then even up into the second coming of Jesus, the millennium, and the uh, advent and eternity. So what I want to do tonight, I'm just going to hit the high spot. Now, you're going to get hung up on some of this stuff, I can tell you. So, But just stay with me, and then go back. And you get, it'll be online for 11 o'clock tonight, I'm sure. And you can go back and slow it down a little bit and get this. Zechariah chapter number 1. The first four verses are about repentance. Leave your Bible laying in your lap. Uh, the Lord been so displeased with them. And uh, verse 3, verse 2 said, verse 3, here's a great verse. The Lord said, turn ye unto me, and I will turn to you. Now that's true for a nation. That's true for a church. That's true for an individual. You, get, you need help tonight. If you'll turn to the Lord, he'll turn to you. Amen. If you'll come to him, he will in no wise cast out. Thank God for great verses like that. You see, already how that those verses were applied to Israel, but you can apply those verses to us in our dispensation as long as you don't contradict what we call church epistles. And that's a, a simple rule to go by. Now, let's look at it here a little bit more. Now, here we go. Going to get worse. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. And I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. And he stood upon...
among the myrtle trees there in the bottom. And behind him, there were red horses, speckled and white. There were red, speckled, white, and uh, horses. And I said, oh, my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked to me said, I'll show thee what these be. And the man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord hath sent to walk to and fro on the earth. Now, basically, those, those, uh, those horses appear. What does that remind you of immediately? The horses in the book of Revelation in chapter 6, they don't match completely, meaning that they're, these are probably different. And I, I'm not sure. I don't know exactly what these would mean, but a horse would represent uh, a nation, its power, horns. Are, when something has horns in the Bible, that represents some kind of power of rulers, of kingdoms, and they were coming again to cause uh, war in the land. Now, look at verse number 17. Here's prophecy. Cry yet, thus saith the Lord, my cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, no matter what happens, and the Lord shall yet, future, Comfort Zion and shall yet. You see that? You see that? You're going to see it over and over and over and over. No matter what happens, no matter how many bombs are dropped, no matter how, the Lord still says, I'm going to choose Jerusalem and they're going to come out on top. Chapter number two, quickly, quickly. Chapter number two, look at verse number four. You can study them horses later. We ain't got time. We got a long way to go. Chapter two and verse four. Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men cattle. Look at verse 5. Here's where you get your old song from. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about. That's how God's going to wind up. When Revelation, fire comes down out of heaven and devours their enemies. After the millennium, the armies of the Lord are going to gather one more time against Jerusalem and fire is going to come down from God and burn them all up. That was wrote about 500 B.C., what I just read. And it ain't happened yet. A wall of fire and will be the glory in the midst of her. Now, you know the a wall of fire about me. I have nothing now to fear. See? That's the song we sing. Uh, now, spiritually, that's song to us. All right? Look at verse 6. Ho, ho, come forth. It's Santa Claus. Where'd you come from? Flee from the land of the north. Ain't that funny? Ain't that funny? That's really not Santa Claus. But isn't it funny? Isn't it funny how everything you find is in the Bible? Ho, 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 come forth. You know, like I said, uh, they showed old Santa Claus. They showed old Santa Claus. They said, uh, uh, they, uh, they showed him a picture of, uh, of Taylor Swift and, and Madonna and Britney Spears. They said, what do you think about that, Santa Claus? He said, ho, ho, ho. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, they... Uh, don't lose your sense of humor. You'll get weird like them college people. Uh, but look here. Uh, that's what old Santa Claus come out there. And he said, look what he said about Jerusalem in verse 8. He said, he, he uh, after the glory has sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. Iraq, Iran, Syria, and wind up being Russia, China, and probably United States for all said and done. For he that toucheth you, toucheth the apple of his eye. <whistles> but anybody touches them Jews, you're touching the apple of God's eye. I know they're aggravating. I know they're obnoxious. I know that a lot of them hate God. But you better not. Uh, you better leave them alone. You don't believe it? Look at verse 11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day. In that day. Now underline them three little words. In that day. You read Isaiah and you understand the word in that day. In that day. Now, that, in that, that phrase, in that day, almost every time is a reference to the millennium and the second advent of Jesus Christ. In that day. Now, learn this. When the Bible said the, the, day, the, the day of the Lord's coming, it never means one 24-hour period. The day of the Lord is a time period at least a thousand and seven years long. So all of that is called the day of the Lord. It's the seventh 1,000 years. We just finished the sixth one, and or depending on how you interpret the calendar. But the seventh day is the day of rest, and that is the day of the Lord. All of that is the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not just, people say, well, the day of the Lord, uh, one time it says it's gloom and gloomy and cloudy, and it does. 
And another place, it'll say it's wonderful and the rapture and everybody shout. The next verse will say it's coming to burn everything up. It's never talking about one day. Not on 24-hour day. It's a time period. Just like in that day, back yonder, in that day and time. Now, remember that. Verse 12. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the Holy Land. There's where we get that. It's called the Holy Land. You know what God told Moses when he first stood there? He said, Moses, take your shoes off your feet for the ground that you stand is holy. God called that land the Holy Land. And not one Muslim owns an inch of it. And not one America owns an inch of it. Thank God we did have one president had enough guts to move the embassy back to uh, Jerusalem where it's supposed to be to start with. Thank God that enough Americans still got enough sense to say, hey, uh, I heard Ralph Sexton talking this morning, and he said, I never would have believed our country would have bowed down to them people like that. They said, you know, when they was up there protesting the other day, hundreds of thousands of people saying we hate Israel, death to the Jew, gas them again. They weren't putting gas chambers, yeah? In our country, our country. And they put that red and green paint on the gate up there of the White House or where they was protesting. And as of this morning, yet it's still there. Left that there for weeks. Who would have ever thought in America, America would have left that on our White House for, for a period? Listen, brother, years ago, we'd have had that wiped off before it got dried. And if anybody had done it, would have been in trouble. God said, He shall yet choose Jerusalem. Chapter 2 and verse 12. All right, now we're moving fast. Chapter 3, verse 1. He showed me Joshua. Now Joshua's picture here of the high priest clothed in filthy rags, and the Lord cleanses him. Uh, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan at his right hand to resist him. That's a very interesting scripture there. You can study that. Uh, it, it happens a couple times in the Bible. Meaning that Joshua may, may be a picture of the man-child deliberately born during the tribulation in Revelation chapter number 12. And uh, a picture of Jesus in the past, Joshua during the tribulation. And it may. So that's chapter 3 and verse number 1. But what he does, he says it, Satan is a real person. All the way through the Bible, the devil is a real individual. The devil is not a figment of our imagination, an evil force, and, and just negative thinking. The devil is real. Satan stood right beside him in order to resist him. And nobody has the power to break that except the Lord himself. As the Bible said, Michael the archangel, fighting over the body of Moses with, my, uh, with Satan, said, the Lord rebuke you. You don't have the power to rebuke the devil. I don't have the power to rebuke the devil. Man, them preachers on TV scare me. They'll say, get out of here, devil. We don't have... Oh, you better watch your mouth, buddy. Hey, he's second in power to God Almighty, man. You better, hold, you better say, the Lord rebuke thee. The Lord rebuke thee. I don't have the power. You don't either to rebuke Satan. But quickly, we're moving. Look at verse 8. Here's you want to study on. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men... Wondered at, for behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch, capital letters. That would be a prophecy of you know who. And brother, he's coming, and he's the one that can settle the issue and take care of the devil once and for all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 9, what will happen in that day. Same as Daniel 2, the stone that I've laid before Joshua, one stone with my eyes, I'll engrave the grave in thereof. There's you some study, y'all. Explain that. Saith the Lord, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. The Bible said in another place, a nation you'll be reborn in a day. All of that will happen in Israel during the tribulation and, and during the millennium. Chapter 4. Look at chapter 4. Here's your one. Look at this verse, buddy. Verse 3, Moses and Elijah. That will show up during the tribulation. The two olive trees, one upon the right side of the bowl, another on the left side thereof. And I said, what are these, my Lord? Verse 5. He said, well, you know, he said, I don't know. And the Lord said, this is the word of the Lord, verse 6, under Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Two things, right quick, before we keep moving. Listen, uh, uh, Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses there in Revelation chapter 11, I hear preachers still, you'd think I'd know better by now, I still hear preachers on TV, radio, saying, 
Uh, now, we don't know who the two witnesses could be. It's probably Enoch and Elijah because Enoch and Elijah never died. And everybody's got to die. So it's probably them. No, no. That's shallow. That's wrong. Uh, everybody don't have to die. Enoch never did die and never will die. If we got raptured out right now, we'd leave without ever dying. So the point that a man wants to die is not a doctrinal statement for everybody. It's a general statement. Unless God does something, everybody's going to die. Now, uh, turn the water to blood, Revelation 11. Elijah made it. Revelation 11. It, there's no doubt about it. the plagues. That's my last two men mentioned in the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. I'll send you them before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, I know I'm going fast, but we got a long way to go, and we're going to get all this done in a ready time of 30 minutes or so. So here we go. Look at it. Verse number uh, 3, Moses and Elijah. And then that great verse, verse 6, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. We would include that in church, in camp meeting. And you preachers learn that. You Everybody needs to learn that. Listen, we don't have the power to change somebody. Not by wit, not by education, not by talent, not by surroundings, not by lights, not by ability to play an instrument, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. You know what got me the night I got saved? The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And that's what got you too. And I want y'all to pray when, 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 when youth camp comes or winter camp comes that the Spirit of God will move in here and do something special. Amen. Chapter 5. Now here we're going to see the UFO. Chapter 5. Uh, look at it. Verse, verse 1. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. That's some of the strangest scripture in the whole Bible. The, I've, read, I've read commentaries this week. You might think I ain't, but I have. I've checked out to see what everybody believes. Most of the modern day contemporary liberal commentators believe that's a Bible. A 30 foot Bible. Uh, and, and it's flying. But I want to show you something here tonight. A, a 30 foot roll, 15 feet wide, and nobody knows what it is. It's unidentified. And it flies. I didn't say a spaceship or Martians in it. I said it's unidentified and it flies. That's unidentified flying object. Now I get accused of a lot of things from my belief about what people are seeing in the sky and they ain't all drunk and they ain't all out on the lake half high that night. Or there, there's military people. The government's confirmed it. Uh, uh, that don't mean nothing, but they're seeing it everywhere. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of testimonies from all over the world when people see UFOs, they're that measurement right there. They're, all, they're 20, 30 feet long. A little and fly. I didn't write it. I, and I'm not saying it was. I'm just saying, listen to me. He said, I saw a flying roll. And he said, What see you? Zechariah, verse 2. I said, A flying roll. The length 20 cubits, that's 30. The breadth 10 cubits at 15 feet. And he said, this is the curse. I think the Bible. This is the curse that goeth forth on the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off on this side. And, and he's swearing, I ain't got time to get it all of it. Look at verse number four. He'll bring it in. And then verse number, uh, let's see. It goes into their houses somewhere there. There it is. Verse four. And into the house to him that false, swears falsely. If you're right with God, serve God, then leave you alone. That curse will come into the house of people who are, quote, open to it. There are people all over the world that are out tonight. Look at that saying, we know you're out there. Give us contact. We know you're out there. Please come and speak to us. Well, it's coming. It's coming. And it ain't the Lord and it ain't angels. Amen. Them seances. Those psychics, they're none of them hooked up with the Spirit of God. None of them. Amen? None of them. I ain't got time to preach on UFOs. We'll do that some other time. But they're, they're now saying, they're now seeing them by up, 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 way up just during the last few months like crazy. I preached that sermon back in 19, uh, I think it was 97 or 98. Uh, there years ago, and boy, I all brought all had Mary and tore all the pieces. And people said I was crazy and lost my mind and everything. And now a lot of them are saying, you know what? We're seeing it now. And you ain't seen nothing yet. All right, so what's what's coming? But look, look here. 
the way to get the job done by the Spirit of God. Now, it's going to get worse here in chapter 5. These th this thing flying around that's 30 feet long and 15 feet wide and is a curse. Then there's an ephah pops up. Look at verse 8. Then cried he upon me and said unto me, Behold, these that go toward the north country cried, the spirit the, cried my spirit in the north country. Look at verse number. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse 8. And he said, wickedness. And he cast it in the midst of an ephah. And he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. The ephah, ephah is like a bushel basket. And it had a lid made out of lead. Here we go. Hard scripture. Look at verse number 9. Then I lift up mine eyes and look. Behold, there came out two women. And the wind was in their wings. These two women had wings. For they had wings like the wings of a stork. Well, well, well. That's where they get the babies come from. Right out of your King James Bible. And they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven. And I said to the angel that talked with me, Whither did these bear ephah? And he said, To build in a house in the land of Shinar. That's Babylon, people. Right back to Babylon. The woman, there's a woman in this thing. There's a woman in this, inside this ephah. And two of them, in, see in verse it said a woman sits in the middle of that basket. And then two other women that had wings carried her and set her on a pedestal at Babylon. That immediately refers to Revelation 17 where the great whore, the bride of Satan, rides a beast. I call it Babylon the Great. Now, I read the commentators this week and I looked this up over and over and over and every preacher uh, not not old-fashioned Bible preachers like us, but every one of those preachers immediately started backing down and saying, now, 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 this don't mean that saying that women are bad. This is not saying that women are wicked. This is not saying, well, it sure is. They're scared to death of being labeled a sexist, and they're scared somebody's going to say, oh, you're talking bad about women. You said women. Listen, people, there's a thousand verses in the Bible that says men's wicked. Why do you get tore up when it says women are? Man gets up and says, women are wicked. <gasps> I can't believe he said that. You don't mind it when we say men are? You are hypocrites. All your problem is. You don't, a, a woman that loves the Bible and right with God, that don't bother her one bit. I mean, these women are wicked. Amen. Lord have mercy. So we learn from these two. They, they have wings like a stork. They are not angels. That's where all the Christmas plays has a blonde-headed woman with her wings in it and saying, angels don't have wings. No angel in the Bible has wings. All angels in the Bible appear as young men. Read it. Genesis 9, I didn't write it. Read it. Every angel in the Bible appears as a young man, and they don't even know it's an angel a lot of times. But these things have wings, so they ain't angels, and they fly, fly like a wing like a stork. That's where they say the stork brings the baby. And they also are women. So, your guess is good as mine. How about it? How about it? Uh, it's, it's some deep stuff that we'll study when we get into this, maybe verse by verse. All right. Uh, here we go. Now, clear that up good for you. <laughs> chapter six. Chapter number six. I'm hoping you'll go home and dig, is what I'm doing. Uh, chapter number six. Look at it. Got to hurry. Chariots from between two mountains, red horses, black horses, white horses. Grizzled horses, represent, four, chariots, representing the four spirits of the heavens. That's one, two, three, and four. It almost matches Revelation chapter number six. About uh, the, the scholars say it's desolation, it's cruelty and guilt, but none of them say what they are because none of them know. I, I'm not sure what all them are, and I don't know any man that does. If you do, send him around. We'd love to hear from him. They claim, they'll spiritualize it, claim it's a lot of stuff. But then there's a branch pops up again. There in chapter number uh, uh, six, somewhere in there, I believe, don't he? Uh, no, it, yeah, chapter six, verse 12. The, the, the branch pops out again. Fake fast is a subject here. Fasting for the wrong reason. Look at verse number uh, uh, five. Speak to people then. When you fasted in more than the fifth and seventh month, those 70 years, did you all fast to me, even to me? When you did you eat and drink not for yourselves and not drink for yourself? He said, He said, when you fast, you fast for the Lord. 
You don't fast to show off. You don't fast to brag about it. You fast only for the Lord. That's what I've tried to teach y'all for years and years and years and years and years. Here's what you're supposed to do. Look at verse number 9. Chapter number 7 and verse number 9. Thus speak of the Lord. Execute judgment. You know what the Lord wants you to do instead of give $100 to bus kids? He wants you to execute true judgment, show mercy and compassion to every man his brother. Don't oppress a widow and the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and don't imagine evil against your brother in your heart. We said all your religious feast and all your religious stuff, God said, treat people right. Get your heart right. That's basically what he said in chapter 7. You won't listen to me? Look at verse 13. Therefore it's come to pass, they cried, he cried and they wouldn't hear, so they're going to cry and I ain't going to hear, say the Lord. See, the Lord gives you medicine. He said, I cried and cried and cried and you wouldn't listen. One day you're going to cry and cry and cry and I ain't going to listen. That's a strong warning. Look at chapter number 8. Chapter number 8. Got to move quickly. Verses 1 and 2. The land again. Lord, Where the Lord came into me saying, Thus saith the Lord, I was jealous for Zion. That's right smack there where that mosque the, the mosque uh, is there in Jerusalem right now tonight with great jealousy. That's what threw old, poor old Oprah off of the bandwagon. Oprah Winfrey lost her faith when she was young. She went to church and the preacher read the scripture where God was jealous and she said, that ain't right. That ain't right. Poor dumb girl. She didn't have parents teach her right and she didn't understand that there is a good godly jealousy. Paul said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy. There's a godly jealousy. There's an ungodly jealousy. Anybody that's married has a, has a godly jealousy over their spouse. Of course you do. That's the kind of jealousy that God said, I'm particular over that land. If you love something, you're jealous over it. And, 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 and another little phrase here in chapter number 8. Only one time in the Bible, boys and girls. Verse number 5. The street of the city shall be full. That future boys and girls playing in the streets. Only time in the Bible. Isn't that some? Isn't that strange? You'd think you wouldn't think that. Now, look at verse number 13. Of course, that is you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel. So will I save you. There's your prophecy. And you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. Amen. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. Yea, many people in strong nations. Iraq. Iran, Russia, China, the UN. This ain't good news for the UN. Many strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the days it'll come to pass. Ten men shall take of all the language of the nation, shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We'll go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. That ain't happened yet. All these nations will one day say, You know what? We're going to go with you because we've heard God is with you. That may have happened in part, but the nations ain't done that. Not, not yet. Chapter number nine. Look, uh, look, you want to see, you want to see it, uh, the news when you go home tonight? Look at verse five. Ashkelon. That's where they sent them first bombs the other day in, in October. That's where Hamas shot. You see that? Uh, look how much, uh, verse two, Hamas looks like Hamas. Look at Ashkelon in verse 5. Look at verse 5. They see it in fear. Gaza. There it is. 19 times the Bible shall see it and be very sorrowful. There's the future for Gaza right there, buddy. For her expression shall be ashamed, and the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. Now, look at verse 9. Take a break. And the prophecy of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, Here's a prophecy. Here's the way you know the Bible's true. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and the colt upon a colt, the foal of an ass, the donkey all shaggy and brown. Fulfilled in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, where it said they come in there when Jesus come in, and he come in uh, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey and the colt, 
the fold of an ass. That was prophecy fulfilled 500 years before it happened. And then they quoted it in the New Testament and said, that's what Zechariah is talking about. Proving to you uh, the Bible again there is the Word of God. Amen. That means His first coming was prophesied and it happened. And that, look at verse 10, His second coming is prophesied and it's going to happen. Look chapter 9 and verse number 10. Uh, let's see. Uh, look at it, verse 10. I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the horse from Jerusalem, the battle bow, shall be from the river to the ends of the earth. He'll rule over the whole earth for a thousand years. First come in verse 9, second come in verse 10. Take a break here and turn to Isaiah 61, just a second. Hold your finger there, turn back to Isaiah 61. You'll see this over and over and over in the Old Testament. Isaiah 61, 700 years before it happened. I'm spitting out a whole lot here, y'all. You go to seminary two years and I get all this uh, in detail. Chapter 6, the under the meek, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, praying for the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Now, you see that bound? Them two little dots right at the word bound. One looks like a little common other. That's 2,000 years of church age. Verse 2, millennium. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all that mourn. Over and over and over the Bible does that. That's why they missed him. That's why they didn't accept him. They couldn't figure it out. Here he comes riding on a donkey and they said, well, the, the Old Testament said you was going to come and smash all of your enemies under your feet. He is. But not then. That ain't happened yet. When he died on the cross, they said, well, that couldn't have been him. That's why the Jews rejected him. They studied their Bible and they said, well, it said he's going to reign over the whole earth. And he got killed. See, it makes it's very important how you read the Bible. And today, the same thing is happening. People don't understand the verses on the second coming, and they're going to miss it. They're going to miss it. Now, we're back in Zechariah now. Chapter number 10. Chapter number 10. Uh, the latter reign. Former and latter rain. Every Pentecostal church of God, Holy Ghost, Apostle in Jesus' name, uh, believes that the latter rain is some big great revival that we're going to have before the Lord comes back. There is no such thing as that at all in the Bible. There is nowhere in the Bible where it says we're going to have a great revival before Jesus comes back. Uh, there's going to be one, but it ain't going to be before He comes back. Ask you the Lord rain. Verse 1, 10, 1. In the time of the latter rain. You know what that means? You say, what does that mean, Brother Dan? It means rain. There's a latter rain, former rain, latter rain. And during the tribulation, it ain't rain for three and a half years. Elijah shuts up the heaven, and the last is going to rain like a flood. At the end of the rain. So that's the showers of rain. Now, chapter number 10, uh, it's uh, during the tribulation there. Elijah's power. James chapter 5, verse 7 talks about that too. Uh, look at uh, uh, verse 6, chapter 10, verse 6. I'll strengthen the house of Judah and save the house of Joseph. There it is again. I'll bring them to the place for them. I'll have mercy upon them. You can't beat that. Thing. It's over and over and over and over. I had not cast them off. I am the Lord their God and will hear them. Now, chapter number 11, beauty and bands. If you can figure out what these are, please. We'll let you teach it next week. Uh, I know I done studied it all, what all the commentators say. It's some pretty tough stuff. Beauty and bands, verse number seven. Uh, and, and Ephraim, they'll be like mighty. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse seven. Under the flock of slaughter, poor of a flock. I took them to me two stave, one I called beauty, another called bands, and I fed the flock. Okay, we can get that part. He's going to use them to feed the flock. We can get that part. Uh, you can spiritualize it and make it all kind of good things, and I've done read all that. But it's, it's strange to me why he would use that terminology. Look at verse 12. Here's some of the strongest prophecy in the Bible. Zechariah chapter 11 and verse number 13. Judas Iscariot betraying Christ and Judas being the Antichrist. 500 years before Jesus showed up the first time. And the Lord said unto me, verse 13, cast it unto the potter. A goodly price I was prized with them and I took the 30 pieces of you got to be blind enough. As a matter of fact, that's quoted in the New Testament. Judas Iscariot, when he goes out, and he all of a sudden, he realizes, I betrayed innocent blood. I don't 
don't, Judas did not get saved. It said he repented himself. He did not get saved. He couldn't get saved. He was a devil. And he come in and he threw down them 30 pieces of silver. And the Jews said, well, we can't put that in the treasury. It's blood money. And they took it and bought a potter's field. And that was prophesied in Zechariah. 500 years earlier, people. There's no doubt this book's the word of God. The Koran wouldn't even attempt something like that. They can't prophesy the future. Now look here what it said. Uh, here, here, comes, here comes Judas. Here comes Judas. And I cut a center of my other staff, even bands, and I break the broken hood, brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So bands was one of his staffs, and beauty was the other staff. And the Lord said to me, take you another instrument of a foolish shepherd. Here's the Antichrist. 16. I will raise up a shepherd in the land. Cut off. I know a lot of preachers like that. Neither neither heal that which is broken to help people that need help. That would stand still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and fly around in a private jet and beg for more money on TV. Don't really get me started. And tear their claws in pieces. Verse 17. It's amazing to me that Judas Iscariot throwing down the 30 pieces of silver and it goes right into Antichrist. Don't you think that's rather strange? Woe to the idol, not I-D-L-E, like, like bored. Idol, like worshiping an idol. Shepherd that leaveth the flock, the sword shall be upon his arm and on his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye utterly darkened. That's where in Revelation the Antichrist gets a deadly wound and his deadly wound is healed and all the world goes crazy and worships the Antichrist. That's coming in the future. That ain't happened yet. And it said he'll have a weak right arm and a bad right eye. That's why all, I've, I've got the videos. Y'all see my rock and roll videos? Every one of those movie stars, Hollywood, that, it's all they cover the right eye. They let their hair come down and cover that right eye. Like, like, the, like, the, like Popeye. Like the old sailors and the and the uh, the uh, people uh, on the ships, pirates and stuff like that. And did you know back in the seventies? I remember preaching about it. They come out with a movie on TV, and it come on every week. You old people remember it? Called the Six Million Dollar Man. Six, not five, not seven. And he had a strong left arm and a strong left eye, and a weak right arm. Right, they didn't know it was in the Bible. That's getting the world ready for the Antichrist that's coming on the scene. Judas Iscariot was cast. The Bible don't say Judas went to hell. It said he betrayed him, his bowels gushed out, and he went to his own place. That's what it says. Acts chapter 1. Now, I know the preachers preach the man that kissed the door of heaven and went to hell. That makes good preaching. And I've done it myself. But it said he went to his own place. And it don't say he is a normal man. Jesus said, I've not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a what? A devil. And that was for the devil come in him. He was a devil, then the devil come in him. So he was a preaching, healing, evangelistic devil. That's what he was. And when he died, he went to his own place. And the Antichrist shows up in the tribulation. Halfway through the tribulation, he dies. He gets shot, probably, and, and his right eye. And they're going to have his funeral, probably. I don't know this. It's my, my, my thinking. To imitate Christ, and all the cameras in the world are going to be turned on him, just like they are. You can see them hostages getting released over there the last couple of days. All them cameras are going to be on him. And about that time, his eyes are going to open, and the spirit of Judas is going to ascend out of the bottomless pit. There in Revelation, come in his body, and he's going to up and come up and say, I am God. And the whole world is going to go crazy over it. Now, if that sounds a little far out to you, just do your homework. Study it about five years. Now, give it the information you need. All right, that's chapter 11. Chapter 12, we're going to finish here in five minutes, Lord willing. Jerusalem, chapter 12, is the most controversial piece of ground on planet Earth. It's what they're fighting over right over there uh, this evening. Or it's, it's tomorrow morning about it there. Well, five o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. Seven hours ahead of us. And they don't occupy it. They own it. And the Bible said in Psalm 122, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Now, look at chapter 12. Everybody look at chapter 12. Verse 3. Verse 3. Chapter 12, verse 3. In that day, 
chapter 4, in that day, chapter, verse 6, in that day, verse 8, in that day, when? That's the millennium. Shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem? Look at verse 8. And he that is among them that day shall be as, be as David. David's going to come back there and, and help rule in the millennium. And the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. It did not happen the first coming, and it ain't happened yet. And it shall come to pass, verse 9, in that day, look here what God said, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's why we tell you over and over and over and over, don't be against them people. God said, I'll bless them that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. And eventually, he's going to fight against every nation that's against Jerusalem. I ain't, I'm on their side. I'm on their side. They're spiritually called Sodom and Egypt in the, in the, in the, uh, in the tribulation because there's so much homosexuality and stuff over there. But by the time it gets done, he said they're the beloved city. Amen. Amen. Chapter 13. Oh, I'm sorry. One more. One more. Look at verse 10. You don't, you don't believe me? You don't believe this talking about Jesus coming back? Verse 10. And I'll pour out upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication shall look upon me whom they have pierced. That's Jesus Christ, people. And look here what it said. And they'll mourn for him as one that mourns for his only son. Look at verse and bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his own begotten son. For his firstborn, I'm sorry. And uh, uh, chapter 13, look at verse 6. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Not scars, wounds. People say, Them scars. When he rose from the dead, it said, it, Thomas put his hand in them wounds. It seems like. That the wounds of Jesus will be in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever and ever for us to see, shout about, and they never will clear up and be scarred. They always be wounds. And we'll look at them and shout and fall down at his feet and worship him. For paying for our sin, keeping us out of hell fire, glory to God. Verse 6, chapter 13, verse 6. They'll say, What are these wounds in thy hand? And he'll answer, Those are those which I wounded in the house of my friends. His own people turned against him. Chapter number. 13, verse 2, the devil gets bound for a thousand years. Look at verse number 2 at the bottom of it. I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. There ain't going to be no demons running around in, here in the millennium either, I reckon. I reckon. I, I'm assuming that's what that's saying. Right, look at uh, verse 4. It'll come to pass in that day. In that day. Now, chapter 14, we're done. The day of the Lord cometh. Not a 24-hour for a thousand years. Spoil be divided in the midst of thee. Verse 2, I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. It's coming again. It's going to happen more and more. Even after the millennium, I'll gather. God gathers all them nations against Jerusalem to punish them for their sins. And look what they do. The city, Jerusalem, will be taken and the house is rifled. That's an unusual statement, isn't it? Rifled, like guns. They didn't even have guns back then. Rifled. There's Hamas going into Israel, shooting people. And the women ravished. They raped the women. They raped, the, they raped women beside their dead husbands. Cut the baby's heads off. And the women ravished. See that? Look at verse 2. And half the city will go in captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off. And then, verse 3, the Lord shall go forth and fight. Against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. The Lord's going to come back. And he's coming back with the, the armies of heaven behind him. In the second advent, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, verse 4. His feet will stand in that day on the Mount of Olives. You've heard that all your life. Which is before Jerusalem on the east. The Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst. And, and the mountain's going to split. Half of it's going to go to the north and half of it's going to go to the south. And he's coming with his saints. Look at chapter verse 5 and the last part. The Lord my God shall come and all the saints with him. That's us. That's us coming back with him to rule and reign. And it'll come to pass in that day. In that day. In that day. Amen. Look at verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. And all the all shall be turned under the plea of Gibbon, Rimon, south of Jerusalem. And it'll be lifted up. Let's, let's look at verse. You'll see a nuclear bomb, nuclear war, probably. 
Verse 12. Their flesh will consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes will consume away in their holes, and their tongues will consume away in their mouth. It'll come past that day. Now look, you know what that verse says? I read where that when a bomb goes on, like, like if I let off a nuclear bomb right here, ever how far it would go, hundreds of miles, that if people were in its way, their eyes would just burn out of their pot sockets, and it just burn the flesh off of them before their skeleton could fall over. That's the day of God when he comes back in flame and fire. Now, if the Lord uses nuclear bombs to do that, that's his business, but he don't have to. He's got his own fire. can take care of that if that's what he needs to do. Now, let's look at it. Verse number uh, 13. It'll come to pass in that day. Lord have mercy. You better be careful in that day. Verse, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, verse verse 3. God fights them and fights Israel. The advents in verse number 4. Jesus come back on a white horse in verse 5. Look at verse number 12. Uh, there's Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran, China, Russia. Everybody gets bombed up with some kind of nuclear war. Verse 16 the millennial reign. Verse 7, 18 is the millennial reign. In the millennium, we go up to Jerusalem from year to year. Verse 16. People ask me all the time, you ever going to go to Jerusalem? I say, I sure am. I'm going every year, a thousand straight years. You get to visit every year there. Uh, I'm on the Feast of Tabernacles. That's in the millennium. And if you don't come up, you're in trouble. Verse number 17 and verse number 18. Anybody don't cooperate, they get no rain. There'll be the plague. Verse 20. And that day. There shall be under the bells, have the bells of horses, holiness unto the Lord. And the pots of the Lord's house shall be like bowls. And verse number 21, in that day, the pot in Jerusalem, there'll be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord. All the, the people that rebelled, the wickedness of man will be outside. And the Lord shall reign forever and ever. And he'll sit on that throne for a thousand years. And the millennium reign goes right on into the eternal reign. And there's your overview of the book of Zechariah. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this little work here tonight you've given us. And, Lord, I pray that you'd help us and guide us into all truth. Bless all the people watching from home and online. I pray that everybody got something to study about and learn and had a hunger for knowledge of your word. And God, go with us tonight. Help us to know as Bible believers that we got the future right here in our hands here tonight in that Bible. Thank you, Lord, that we're not as dark and we're overtaken as like a thief in darkness, but we're children of light. Do what ought to be done in our lives tonight. Bless all our folks. Help us to walk as children of light. Be able to take this to the, at work and help people and answer their questions. We'll thank you for it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, camera's off. About two questions right quick. Comments, straighten me out, help me out.